Today on Landline, removing wool without shearing. I work with the two most sceptical groups of people on the planet, farmers and scientists, you know? No one believes anything is going to work, but I think this will. Turning farm waste into food. I want it to be thought of as a front runner in terms of sustainability, in terms of making our world a little bit better. And the can-do Aussie engineering firm. To my father's credit, I would have to say, you know, we were never told that you can't do anything. We were probably fed the opposite, so, well, there's a workshop. You can build whatever the hell you want to build. Go and do it. Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. For decades, Australia's wool industry has searched for cost-effective ways of removing wool from sheep without shearing. One solution called bioharvesting has come tantalisingly close but has failed to make the jump to the paddock. Now, in a breakthrough, South Australian researchers think they might soon be able to offer producers an alternative to shearing. Riverina rural reporter Cara Jeffrey has the story. This field day in southern New South Wales, Professor Phil Hind knows he has his work cut out for him. I work with the two most sceptical groups of people on the planet, farmers and scientists, you know. No one believes anything is going to work, but, it, but it, I think this will. We've been working on an alternative to shearing for about 20 years now, and people would be aware of bioclip and robot shearing and so on. We took a different approach to those. They were basically trying to replicate shearing. You know, getting the wool off by cutting it. One of them cut it, by a clip cut it with a chemical, and robot shearing was using the same sort of equipment to cut wool. In case you missed it, about two decades ago, Bioclip emerged and was touted as a biological defleecing process. Sheep were given a single vaccination of something called epidermal growth factor, a naturally occurring protein that caused wool fibres to break. The fleece was then shed into a net the sheep was wearing and later removed. We took a completely different approach to that. We decided that if it was possible to make wool weak enough to be easily broken by a non-cutting machine, but strong enough to stay on in the field. That's a pretty big ask. And probably 20 years ago, we got some way towards that. We, we got a long way, actually. We created a weak point. We could break it with a little simple machine that didn't cut you. But there was something missing, and that was we were doing it with a protein called Zane. And Zane is part of corn protein. And when we fed that to sheep, we found that it created the weak point we wanted. But we knew that feeding wasn't the way to go. We knew that we had to have better control of how much the animal got and for a short period of time. So we, we needed an injectable. And that's where we've made the big breakthrough now. So how is this different to Bioclip, which was taken off the market nearly 10 years ago due to lack of industry support? This is a completely different system. The idea is we create the weak point with an injection which is done the same as farmers do for vaccinating sheep, uh, subcutaneous, under the skin. And we wait two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, for the wool to grow under that weak point. And then we break it with a simple machine that just takes it off with no combs and cutters. In fact, we hope it'll be done w without any people involved. It'll just be done with an automatic machine. And that's a game changer. Phil Hind is confident farmers could take care of injecting their flock. It's also suitable for pregnant ewes, unlike Bioclip. We're aiming for an injectable um, that farmers can do themselves. So line the sheep up in a race, under the skin, simple, quick, configured for body weight. So you, you have to take into account body weight, but that can be done now. Put the sheep out again, two or three weeks at your convenience, four weeks, um, and bring them back in and the machine takes it off. There's more than 60,000 wool growers in Australia and many are struggling to find shearers. It's hoped that new research into biological wool harvesting will give growers more options when it comes to removing the fibre. You just do a what we call a harvestability score. It's, it's like a pluck score. You take a staple, 
and you can very easily train yourself to know that it's perfect for harvesting. And you just pull on it. While merino sheep and crossbreds have handled the injected protein, meat sheep have been a more challenging code to crack. The reason it, it didn't work in our experiment this time round with meat sheep was because meat sheep grow wool so slowly that it, the, the mechanism doesn't trip itself up. But when we get the injectable, we can dial that up and make sure it does knock the, the follicle um, process. A visible advantage from biologically harvesting wool is the clean skin left on the sheep. I reckon if you lined up a mob of sheep over here that have been shorn traditionally and you lined up ones that we've done with our system, you'd automatically say these, these just look better. Each follicle is hit with the agent at exactly the same time, so every follicle on the sheep is affected at the same time. Right now, Phil Hind is reticent to forecast how much it will cost farmers. Very early days to start predicting costs, to be honest. At the moment, the agent that we're had as our best candidate, I costed at the extraction that we're doing, is about 20 cents a dose. Now, that's not what it's going to cost when it gets onto the market, but we're in the right ballpark, right? While Phil and his team of researchers have worked out how to weaken the fibre via an injectable, they now need help with an engineering solution to remove the wool. They've called on the expertise of engineer Rodney Brook. Our challenge is to produce a device that will break that wool, take it away from the skin effectively and efficiently uh, and uh, not hurt the shearer or the uh, sheep. At the field day, the engineer had a display of all the different tried, tested and failed devices. We've tried duck pluckers, rotary brushes, devices where you've got pins and advancing and retiring from a surface. We've also tried uh, reciprocating comb devices. Uh, they seem to be uh, the, the, the best at the moment. So what's happening here is Rodney's machine is going across the sheet at about the same speed as a shearing handpiece it's just peeling the wool off and the wool is just falling in front of the device. Professor Phil Hind also has a few ideas. At the moment we're looking at kind of plucking machines and so it just moves across the body. When we get it right, the wool peels off the front of that plucking device and just we, we, we hope to remove it then with a, a vacuum system. I don't think it'll come off as a fleece. I think we'll end up sucking it off with vacuum and it'll be treated as fibres. Wool grower funded research, development and marketing body Australian Wool Innovation has sunk $1.4 million into this research so far. This is the number one priority. We're regularly told that by wool growers across Australia that we need to sort this, this issue out. Uh, and we are prepared to invest, invest heavily in that space. At the moment that uh, investment has been reasonably moderate, but there will be development of technology for removing wool uh, and who knows what other things are required in the future. But the board are very committed to taking this right through the commercialisation and, and, and uh, providing another tool in wool growers, uh, in wool growers shed. The COVID-19 pandemic and closed international borders created a national shearer shortage. It showed Australia's wool industry the risk of relying on seasonal shearers, particularly from New Zealand. While AWI chairman Jock Laurie will continue to use shearers if he can, he's open to biological harvesting if he needs to. What I want is choice. I need to be able to shear at the right time, I need to be able to shear and the cost of shearing needs to be at an affordable rate and I need to be provided with the tools to allow that to happen and if it turns out that that I need to use biological shearing because the shearers are held up somewhere, then I won't hesitate in using it. It's really important that the industry can get their sheep shorn on time and that they can put it around a budget that actually allows them to stay in the industry. And so what this is all about is developing the technology to allow them to do that, to have choice. And without that, we're losing growers out of the industry. We now know we can go bang. This field day, hosted by Australian Wool Innovation at Canago in southern New South Wales, was the first opportunity most people in the wool industry have had to see biological wool harvesting in action. George Millington from renowned South Australian merino stud Collinsville was pretty impressed. If there's anything that we can invest in as an industry to actually try and make sheep farming more attractive and try and make wool growing more attractive and easier for the grower to do, I think we should do it. 
from what I've seen today, it's probably more being able to give a grower who wants to shear 200 sheep and is unable to get shearers for the day, but I think there'll still be a lot of room for large contract shearing teams uh, to shear in commercial situations. Ian Lugston and his family used Bioclip on their Merino flock for several years, so he was keen to see the difference, especially since the nets that were used in the Bioclip process have been ditched. The only problem we had with it was getting the wool out of the nets. Because we have a lot of trefoil, um, the, the issue then was it took quite a while to get the wool out of the nets. From what he's seen from the new research, it's the animal welfare benefits that impress him. So the animal doesn't have a hot hand piece over it at all, and you can guarantee there's no skin pieces. Yeah, at the end of the day, um, I think it's a, um, it's a better option, or it's a, 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 a better option for harvesting, yes. Interestingly, the younger generation had more concerns. I think with the wool removal, I'd like to see it come off as more of a full fleece, maybe the mainline fleece and then your skirtings off separately. Uh, what we saw today was more like shearing in a traditional sense. I think if you're going to do that, you may as well just, just run them in and, and shear them rather than injecting, letting them out, bring them back in. Uh, it looked quite slow. Uh, and, but it's very early days. I actually personally think that we need to be putting more um, emphasis or, or, or money into uh, training shearers. I think that not just the, the, uh, the physical part of shearing, but more the, the lifestyle and welfare and, and, uh, and fitness of, of shearers. I think that um, it's a professional industry. It's, it's, a, it's as much a physical act as, as playing footy. And I think if you treat it that way and treat the lifestyle and... Um, and your financials that way, I think that that could have bigger outcomes for shearers, I think, than, than anything else, to tell you the truth. Those devoted to ensuring the Australian wool industry continues to operate at a high standard believe shearers and wool handlers won't be out of a job anytime soon. Shearing is very important to our family. I have two daughters and a son who are shearing, so it's very close to my heart and um, it's a great industry for them and they've really um, found some great advantages in being in that industry. Um, I do, don't see this as being the, the, you know, the end of shearing and hopefully a lot of young people will come on board and see wool harvesting, wool classing and, and uh, wool handling as being a great career to be in. Shearer trainer Brian Sullivan, who was a shearer for more than 40 years, isn't worried about losing his job. It won't be up and running, I don't think, before I retire. There you are. So I watched it yesterday and um, seen what they said they have achieved and I personally think that the young blokes around here do a better job than what it was doing yesterday. Even the man behind the breakthrough research knows this won't do shearers out of a job. We're not aiming to get rid of shearing. We're aiming at coming up with an alternative that people can have at their disposal if they can't get shearers, which has been a problem through the pandemic. Um, and if that happens again or something else happens again that limits shearing availability, we want an alternative. We can't have the industry just stop. John Roberts, who heads up Australian Wool Innovation, is prepared to spend more money to make biological wool harvesting work. He's now calling for anyone with engineering solutions for removing the weakened fibre to pitch their ideas. We want to spend as much as is needed on this project. Um, right now, it's, it's apparently it's enough, but I think going forward, when we get to the harvesting piece, we're going to need to invest more money, absolutely. Beyond removing the wool from the sheep, John Roberts sees benefits further down the processing pipeline. One of the things we've always been proud of as a nation is that we've led the world in terms of wool preparation standards. We don't want to lose that, and I think that's, that'll obviously be a burning question for a lot of people. But, you know, my mind immediately goes to, you know, taking the wool straight off the back into the wool pack and hopefully preparing, you know, maintaining those preparation standards or even improving them. So, look, I think it's going to be something we're going to have to look at really closely, that we don't compromise the quality of the clip. While the research is promising, biological wool harvesting still has some way to go before growers will be using it on farm. There's a journey, there's APVMA approvals, there's, there's dosage trials we have to do. Look, I, I, I'd, I'd be loath to, to promise a, a date, but I can't see anything in the, in the next two years. But hopefully 
after that we might start to see things materialise, but it's going to be a journey. However, the professor leading the charge is determined to see it through. This has been something I've been working on for 20 years. I'm not going to let it go um, and I, I think it will work. I, I'm not dying till this happens. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kath Sullivan. Victorian grain and sheep farmer David Jahinki has been elected president of the National Farmers Federation. Elected by its member organisations, Mr Jahinki has the task of leading the farm lobby as it fights for a say on federal policies ranging from climate change to natural emergency responses, industrial relations, animal welfare, biosecurity and many more. I spoke with him earlier. David Jahinki, welcome to Landline. Hello. Just days into your presidency at the National Farmers Federation, the federal government walked away from a trade deal with the European Union. It seems unusual that farmers would be celebrating no deal, but you've notched this up as a win. Why is that? Well, it's quite simple. We made it very clear when we've been working with the government all the way through this journey to say we'd rather have a no deal than a bad deal. And what we saw that was offered to Australia was unequal to um, our other trading competitors as far as access and um, the ability to actually get good value out of the trade. So it was very simple for us to support um, Minister Farrell in saying no, we want a better deal if we want to consider um, put locking us into essentially a, a trade deal that would disadvantage Australian farmers for another 50 odd years. The ABC understands that an agreement had pretty much been reached on geographic indicators that both sides had settled on the use of names like Parmesan and Feta. Uh, what sort of trade access was the EU offering for those commodities like beef and sugar? Well that's where it fell down. When we speak about some of the big um, trading uh, commodities that we'd like to see being once again beef there was very little movement in fact when we compared it against other trade deals compared to New Zealand to Canada to South America it was absolutely uh, a lot less than that and what we were asking for is comparable uh, volumes in those areas and they weren't prepared to, to move or allow any further access therefore the decision was very simple. What can you tell us about the conditions that the Europeans wanted to impose on Australian farmers trading there? Well, the two main issues that we did have was the geographical indicators that we mentioned earlier and the effect that would cause especially the dairy industry and the costs and the loss of market share to reshape how we utilise those products with different names. But more so concerning was us getting locked into systems of describing how we are sustainable, describing how we comply with their standards when in fact we have a different farming system, we have different ways of producing our food which bears very little resemblance to their climate, to their soils, and not accepting our way of describing sustainability, especially when we are very uh, much a leading nation in the different techniques that we use and the processes that we have in place, and not having those recognised. Do you see that as your challenge, not only with European consumers, but potentially with Australian ones, that you need to explain why it is the way that farmers do the things they do here? Absolutely. We're not the only nation who has concerns about utilising or using um, EU, the European Union's definitions and terms, especially around sustainability. There are a lot of other countries around who feel the same, especially within the CANS group. And for us, that's one of the main reasons why we are getting into conversations around COP, conversations around the environmental network nationally, to, to say, all right, this is where we, we see Australia, but then taking that message globally and partnering with other countries, other trading countries, who have the same issues that aren't necessarily locked into how you, the European Union see the world. You've arrived as president and launched a campaign on all at the same time, calling for farmers to be allowed to farm. Why the need for such a campaign? And I think it's fair to say it's been quite aggressive towards the, toward the government. Well, some may say aggressive, others may say we're just stating all of our grievances in one simple message, and that is, once again, to keep farmers farming, which it is about going through a list of policies that we've had issues for a very long time, such as water buybacks over getting projects in place to help solve 
the current water sharing within the Murray-Darling Basin, such as the industrial relation legislation that's currently being proposed to go through government and the impacts that will potentially have in agriculture. And then also trade negotiations or trade opportunities being taken off the table with the removal of live sheep exports by sea. The fact that it's having a huge impact on Western Australia, but then also the, the confidence within the sheep industry across the board, let alone people or within the can different you, industries. Can you just elaborate on what impact uh, the government's ban is having on the sheep industry in WA? Because this seems to be a point of contention. Well, the farmers who have been contacting me directly are saying that they don't have confidence to either build their flocks up or retain their flocks into the future because they're not sure what's going to happen. So it's that long-term confidence of the uncertainty when they believe that it's a trade that is really important to them and they can see a long-term benefit for it. So it's that uncertainty that is causing effect. Water buybacks, IR, live exports seem to be in your sights. Are there any other key issues that you're, that you're wanting to get on the front page? Well, when we talk about agriculture holistically, the reason why all of the National Farmers Federation family are getting behind this uh, campaign is because they're concerned if we're not making a stand on these issues, who's next? What industries are going to be targeted? What other industries are going to be shaped by policy that's not necessarily coming out of agriculture? And so as a collective, we're said, this is a line in the sand. We want to make sure that both the people in Parliament and then also the wider agricultural community can hear that these are issues that we want to fight for. And for us, um, it's not about disagreeing. We want to see the positives out of this, um, ensuring that we are demonstrating the environmental credentials or the, the rationale behind why we want to achieve these certain outcomes. And it's not about being confrontational as such, but saying that we've had a lot of conversation We've almost had enough talk in some of these areas. It's very clear what we want and we're packaging up and delivering it as if we continue down this pathway, if we continue to make these small changes in certain areas, the cumulative effect is hurting farmers and they're saying enough's enough. Can we please just get back to production? Can we please get back to profitability? And can we please make sure that when we talk about that in a sustainable framework that we're putting agriculture first? David, you've come into the role at a time when we've got an El Nino on the cards and livestock prices are tanking, to use the words of your predecessor, Fiona Simpson. Do you think you could have timed your run a little bit better? Yes, it is challenging times in agriculture, but agriculture is a great industry. It does rise to the challenge. We use a lot of world leading techniques and we also are very proactive in making hard decisions early. So it's going to be tough. I realise that. I'm not shirking from any of those responsibilities, but I do want to make sure that we support farmers the best we can through these trying times. It's going to be interesting. David Jahinke, thanks for your time. Thank you. David Jahinke has been elected president of the NFF for two years, replacing Fiona Simpson. West Australian farmer John Hassel was elected unopposed as vice president. For this week, that's Landline News. A former scout leader in South Australia has created a sustainable food business from farm waste. Kelly Johnson makes meals, snacks and garnishes from a host of fruits and vegetables. And as Landline's Kerry State discovered, so far only one fruit has defeated her. Alright Liz, if you do um, potato and obviously sweet potato. At Monato, east of Adelaide, Kelly Johnson is refashioning rejected fruit and veggies. Cherry tomato, I'll do onion. This stew is packed full of all sorts of dehydrated farm seconds. In a business where food specs are pretty easy to meet. Smell those mushrooms. We take marked, small, scratched, cracked, you name it. If I would eat it, I'll use it. And I'll pretty much eat anything, so... <laughs> but this is not what Kelly imagined she'd be doing four years ago, when she left her job in Adelaide and returned to her hometown of Maipalonga. I had a friend who was throwing away one tonne of dried peaches a year. So I said to him, I'd go to a couple of markets and I would sell the peaches for him. So I value added, did a bit of chocolate dipping and they went. So then my husband said, well, now you'll have to get a job. And I thought, ooh don't really want to do that. This was fun. So looked around, lots of produce, decided I'd have a go at a few other things. 
She expanded from stone fruit into citrus, right at the time drink garnishes were taking off. Oh, these look great, Brian. Oh, that's good. With the diverse local farming community happy to keep what they grow off the ground. We've got a few wind marks on them, but they'll be good for what you're doing. Even if they weren't convinced their new market would be around for long. So when she first came to you with the idea, what did, what did you actually think? I thought, oh, well, this will last five minutes and she'll be out the door. But she's gone bigger and better than I ever thought. After initially drying fruit with sulphur, Kelly switched to dehydrating to meet the demand for preservative-free food, gradually building from one small dehydrator in her house to ten commercial units. And when more veggies started rolling in in winter, the former scout leader decided to mix things up a little and take the business in a new direction. So I started thinking about how I had utilised vegetables in the past with my scouts to make lightweight meals hiking and I thought, well, I could just adopt that same philosophy and make meals. She had no trouble selling her first products, a veggie soup and an apricot curry. What followed was often dictated by what farmers delivered. I had a farmer say, I've got a tonne of eggplant, can you do something with it? And I said, I'm not sure. And did a bit of investigating, we created ratatouille out of that. So that whole product wouldn't exist if that farmer hadn't come to us with byproduct, with waste product. Kelly's family has also come up with some bright ideas, even if she wasn't always sold. So my sister said to me, oh, you should do chow mein. And I went, cabbage? I went, cabbage? Cabbage would be hard. And she goes, no, no, it'll be easy. And it kind of is easy, but it's like trying to hair dry hair. You put it into the dryer and the fans blow it out. So it's really difficult. The factory is smothered in cabbage every time we do it, but it's a top seller. From zucchini, pumpkin and potatoes to mushrooms and tomatoes, if it can be saved from a farm or even a backyard, it can be turned into something edible. Well, almost. Much to Kelly's frustration, the avocado has not made it beyond the test kitchen, after efforts to turn it into all sorts of things, including a powdered guacamole. In the process of drying it and grinding it, it turns into a disgusting, oily paste that was horrible. It smelled bad, really wasn't good. That's the biggest failure we've had. Beyond that, everything else has worked. She's also found buyers well beyond farmers' markets. We just got an order from Pitanjara. Especially after COVID <laughs> shut down that option, forcing her to approach wholesalers to stay in business. When I got that first yes, the power that, that gave me, you know, the, the excitement and the drive that I was able to put it into an actual shop and sell, sell my product, massive, massive for me. As the business has expanded, Kelly started sourcing seconds from growers beyond Maipalonga, including this strawberry farm in the Adelaide Hills. She's also looking further along the supply chain, picking up leftovers from Adelaide's central market. But after having grown up on the land, she says supporting farmers is a priority. If I have a choice to get it 10 cents a kilo cheaper here or 5 cents a kilo or 20 cents a kilo here, but I can go direct to a farmer and pay a little more to them, I'll do that. I will pay it to the farmer every single time if I can. Green Valley Strawberries already has markets for many of its seconds, processing some in its cafe and selling others in the farm shop. But manager Steph Rizaklis says with up to a third of the fruit often affected by sunburn or rain, there are still plenty that don't make it into the punnet. Oh, they look great. They and while that means the family's sheep have a good feed, she's not knocking back the new market Kelly's business has offered up. So the bigger the strawberry, the wow. better. You can thank the cooler weather for that. Slow yeah. down the ripening. Then so I think with um, producing strawberries, we are at the mercy of the weather. And sometimes we can't help that we have damaged fruit. You know, they are grown outside. They're quite a soft skinned fruit. So it's great to have people like Kelly who don't need the perfect A-grade strawberries for their business. Beautiful. There are growing markets for second-grade fresh produce these days, but Kelly says about half of what she picks up is truly going to waste. Often we're getting things that are on the verge of as far as they can go. 
So we've got to get to them fast. We can't leave them sit. We can't store them and do it. We've got to get them in the factory, get them cut, get them in the dryer and done. Until last year, Kelly operated the business out of her home, where it took over most of the surfaces. But a health crisis changed that. The 100% reason we moved the business out of the house was because I got diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And I just knew that I couldn't recover if I had to have everything inside the house with me. I would have kept working, I would have kept pushing, I would have kept doing, and I needed to stop and actually take a breath for a little while. Thankfully, she crossed paths with a local pomegranate juice producer who offered to share their Monato factory. In return, Kelly has started value-adding the pomegranate seeds after juicing and another frothy byproduct. So a 10 kilo lot of juice will make under a kilo of pomegranate powder. So highly concentrated, loads of nutrients, and we're now looking at ways to on-sell that for them. So that's a really great way of using scrap. The company sells around 80 different lines, and they have to earn their place on the shelf. If you took me back two years, I couldn't imagine cutting one product out of my range because I'm very attached to them, I created them, they're like my little babies. Now I employ people and I need this business to work. Now I'm much more cutthroat. If I'm looking at a product and you know the public is saying, hmm, hmm, we're not really into that one, it's gone. The business has kept growing through fire, floods and COVID. But turning a profit this year has been tough as the soaring cost of living changed buyer habits. While meals have remained stable, demand for drink garnish is slowed. But Kelly Johnson says she's not too worried. I really believe in the business and I, in fact, embrace at times the challenges that come our way because they make, they force you to stop, reevaluate, think and pivot. You know, go somewhere else, do something different, change it up. And that's what she's doing here. While Kelly developed the meals side of the business with families in mind, some of her biggest fans are travellers. Why are you producing hiking meals? Because our customers asked us to go smaller. <laughs> it's almost a return to her scouting days, but she promises the product has come a long way. I used to get the kids to create their own disgusting little concoctions. You know, we'd have all <laughs> kinds of things laid out and they'd go along and create their meal and take it out. And of course they'd eat it because they made it. Yeah. Um, and that is where this is driven from. My whole business is driven from that concept. And while she didn't have much ambition at the start, it's well and truly kicked in now. I want it to be thought of as a, you know, front runner in terms of sustainability, in terms of, you know, making our world a little bit better. I want us to make an impact. Hello, I'm Tim Lee. Still to come on Landline, a treat for tractor lovers, a legendary Upton tractor. G'day, I'm Matt Brand. Australia's largest customer for live cattle has long been Indonesia, and back in 2019, it imported almost 700,000 head. But since then, this trade has been in decline. Now, the global pandemic did play a role, and so too has the discovery of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease in Indonesia. But what about the rise of frozen Indian buffalo meat being exported to Indonesia? Analyst Simon Quilty is in India at the moment. He's been touring several meatworks. I spoke to him about what he's seen and what it could mean for Australia's cattle industry. Matt, um, India's buffalo industry today is truly back on the march in terms of um, both capacity and their ability. So in the last three to four years, we've seen a number of major operators here uh, consolidate in terms of becoming larger and a lot of the small players have been pushed out of the trade. So we've seen Meatworks being upgraded because now they're com truly competitive in all the other markets around the world. And so Simon, how big of a customer has Indonesia become for Indian buffalo meat? Indonesia is really um, an important market. It sits at the moment, Matt, around about third. The number one market is Vietnam, followed by Malaysia. Um, and the other critical market is Egypt and the Middle East, where 
almost half of all of exports out of India today go into the Middle East. But those top three markets that you just mentioned, they're all export destinations for Australian live cattle. How much competition is this Indian buffalo meat now creating? I think it creates an enormous amount of competition. And I think next year in 2024, that competition is going to increase even more. And why I say that, Matt, is that estimates for Egypt in particular is that imports will be down 30% due to the challenges of their local economy. And basically getting paid out of um, Egypt has been challenging. So that meat, buffalo meat, has to go elsewhere. And to me, you're going to start to see more volume pushed into markets like Indonesia that will displace Australian cattle in that environment. But interestingly to me, Vietnam has the ability to absorb that extra meat and also extra cattle out of Australia because at the start of this year, that grey channel to China reopened. So even though we're going to see, I think, a challenging time in Indonesia, I'm hoping and believing that Vietnam may step up and you might say take on that role. So do you think Indonesia will ever return to a time where it buys 600,000 head plus of Australian cattle each year? I do, Matt, but I think it's going to take time. I think it's going to be another year of probably a difficult um, shipments. Um, my own estimates at the moment put you know, live cattle exports for this year at about 335,000 head, which is pretty well exactly what we shipped last year. And I could see next year being another challenging year. Um, but I think once we get the flow back, once we get some normality, and also we've got to keep in mind that, you know, the economy in Indonesia is challenged and that too needs to have some time to pick itself up. But I do see us getting back to some more traditional flows and, and volumes um, probably after 2025, 26. And Simon, does any buffalo meat stay in India or does it all get exported? It pretty well is 99% exported. There are two states only that consume beef for the one of the word um, buffalo, and that is Kerala and Sikkim. But the quantities they consume are really quite small, Matt. Chicken is actually the number one protein consumed, but also lamb and mutton is, is a huge part of their um, their diet here as well. So as export opportunities for Australia under the new free trade agreement, Matt, um, I think that there will be opportunities, particularly for goat meat and for mutton exports into this market. Um, and I think, you know, carcass shipments because of the low cost of wages here, I think is really where the huge opportunity lies. That's Simon Quilty from Global Agritrends. So let's take a look at live export prices. They are down and there's not much happening. There were no ships out of Darwin this week and most Territory cattle producers seem to be fighting fires. It's a different story in the box beef trade though, where exports to Indonesia are up 75% year on year. And the biggest market for our beef is now the US, which has been on a buying spree. In the sale yards this week, a bit of rain in New South Wales and Queensland boosted confidence. The National Restocker Heifer Indicator, it went up 45 cents, and the Eki had its strongest weekly gain for the year. The Restocker Lamb price held firm this week, despite an extra 18,000 head making up the indicator. Mutton prices are tough though, especially in Tasmania. Now here's something new. To reflect the rise and rise of online livestock sales, Mean Livestock Australia has launched the Online Young Cattle Indicator, which is in cents a kilo live weight, and the Online Lamb Indicator, which is on a dollars per head basis. In the wool market this week, there were some gains at the finer end, but falls for most of the crossbred types. Some big news for cotton this week pushed the futures price to its lowest point of the year. A report by the International Cotton Advisory Committee predicts cotton production will rise next year, 
but consumption will fall. It also said global cotton reserves were expected to reach their highest level on record, which is another way of saying that there's a lot of cotton just sitting in warehouses, especially in China. Meanwhile, in Australia, conditions are looking pretty good for cotton growers in the Riverina of New South Wales. Around 80,000 hectares of irrigated cotton has been planted. Not much dryland cotton going in, though, with growers wary of that dry forecast for the summer. Wheat futures jumped early in the week following news of a Russian missile hitting a civilian vessel in the Black Sea. By the looks of these videos, it seems growers in central west New South Wales might have been in a bit of a hurry this week to get crops off the paddock and under cover before the rain arrived. Grain Corp has received over a million tonnes of grain from New South Wales this harvest. With more than half of that coming in the last week, the harvest pressure continues to weigh on prices though. Wheat values fell in most areas. That is the Landline Check on prices. Keep it rural. Across the country, broken down, worn out tractors languish in paddocks and sheds. Keen collectors will pay big money for the chance to restore the rare ones. And as Landline's Tim Lee found, an Australian made tractor is at the top of their wish list. Some people celebrate Corowa as the birthplace of Australian Federation. A rare few honour it as the birthplace of the legendary Upton Tractor. Yeah, it's unique, to say the least. <laughs> In fact, so unique and so highly esteemed by vintage tractor enthusiasts that some journey from overseas to this little New South Wales town, especially to see one of these rare machines. You know, there's people all over the world that come to look at them and, uh, you know, pe people are still amazed by them, yeah. So for tractor tragics, it doesn't get any better than this. Five Upton tractors in a row. The Henty Fuel Days in southern New South Wales this year marked its 60th anniversary in style. The organisers tracked down these machines and their devoted owners. This headline attraction was the first time there's been so many Uptons assembled in one spot. So what makes this tractor so special? There's a range of reasons. It's rarity for a start. No more than three dozen tractors were ever made. No one's quite sure exactly how many. Somewhere around that. <laughs> I mean, they obviously didn't have the bookkeeping up to scratch, I don't think. But it was a world beater, well ahead of its time. Decades after the final machine rolled out of the workshop, it still punches or at least pulls, well above its weight. The Upton story began with Arthur Upton, who started the family engineering business in Corowa in 1944. The Second World War finished and there was disposals. They were disposing of used military equipment. Arthur was a wheeler and dealer with an uncanny knack of repurposing machinery, especially army wartime surplus. His skill was he could see a use for something that no one else could. So that was his forte. Especially armoured vehicles. Initially, he just cut off all the armour that wasn't required and they had two diesel engines, so he'd pull one engine out and just leave one engine in there and built a big scrub rake on the front to clear Mallee scrub down there. And then he'd use the other engine to attach a water pump on a skid and sell it as an irrigation pump. With materials still in short supply in post-World War II Australia, this bush engineering works became skilled at improvising, inventing and manufacturing. In 1962, Arthur Upton built a prototype tractor, the Upton 180, which arose from a simple need. Everyone wanted to be able to cultivate more or quicker or easier or whatever. The very first tractor, it was cobbled together over a number of years. They would work on that when they had not much else to do. It wasn't a priority. Those initial 180 horsepower tractors showed Arthur Upton's entrepreneurial flair with spare parts. Had a brainwave 
let's put some of this stuff together and use it up and get a tractor out of it. And away she went. <laughs> sort of amazing things to look at. The big back end on them is unreal. These are early model Uptons, the 180, manufactured from the mid-1960s. They're made of armoured plate because, incredibly, the gearbox and the rear end were taken from army tanks. There was variations of the Sherman, the Grant and the Lees tanks had the same final drive and gearbox parts, all made by Mac in America. Well, I counted one day 32 Grant tanks in the yard. He decided these big four-ton transmissions, there wasn't much use for them, so he decided to start building a few tractors just to get rid of the tank diffs. That was the main thing. And he fitted them with the UD engines that he bought from Japan. The UD was a far superior two-stroke diesel, and the robust military parts proved to be perfect. Ones that would tolerate the type of horsepower and the wheel sizes that we wanted to put on them. You still got to bear in mind economy. These parts were there, they were cheap. So we could make the first of the 180 horsepower tractors, we could sell for around 14,000 pounds. And then they only ever built them when someone wanted them. It wasn't, we want to take over the world, it was just, he'd build them as required. Those early models had extra wide wheels and were a distinctive shade of pink. Bill Keynes was mixing up some paint in the shed one day in the paint shop, and that's what turned out. And we knew of nothing else that was that colour, so it went on. The business grew and diversified from the 1960s, making irrigators, notably a travelling type, propelled by the water it was emitting. The firm invented and made every type of rural machinery. At one stage, he was the biggest employer in Corowa, next to the Corowa Hospital, and he uh, nearly always had about 30 men employed. And they were all sort of bush mechanics, and each and every one of them had a, a forte of some description. In 1973, a 225 horsepower model emerged, which still had some tank parts, along with some cutting edge components. By then, Carl Upton had joined the firm, designing and building ever bigger, more powerful tractors, of great appeal to large scale grain growers. They were probably three times the size of anything on the market at the time. For example, uh, the most popular tractor was a Chamberlain, a 98 horsepower Chamberlain. In 1977, I'd built the HT series, which was 350 horsepower. So here you have a tractor that might weigh eight tonne, and I've got a tractor that could weigh 20 tonne. Many thought these distinctive yellow machines Carl changed the colour scheme, would be a flop because they were simply too big. It was such a big tractor at the time that not a lot of people, they just thought, oh, well, it's just too big. It's just unmanoeuvrable, just too big for the farm because it was going out when people had little grey Fergies and here's this about a 10, 12 tonne tractor. <laughs> and the Upton was a big banger that for open country and probably, well, there would have been a lot more around if they, circumstances just sort of stopped them making them. Only eight HT models were ever made. Production ceased in 1981. By then, similar tractors were being imported at a cheaper price, and the rural economy was going through some tough times. But the last one rolled out 43 years ago, the Upton still stands apart, especially the HT model. Well, the, the last one is uh, still is the biggest two-wheel drive tractor in the world. It's a big name if you're a tractor aficionado. Oh, it? yeah, well, I mean, it, it did cause a stir because no one's ever done it. And still today, there is no production-built, factory-built tractor that is 350 horse two-wheel drive. Y yes, there are big four-wheel drives, but not two-wheel drive. Hmm. It still holds world records for its capacity to pull. Card Upton says it's a case of fundamental physics. You see, it's very simple. An elephant can pull more than a horse because it's bigger and a tractor is the same. The bigger and heavier you make them, the more they're going to pull. And 
of course, you have to take into consideration all the efficiencies of the traction of the tyres and so forth, and on our machine, it all worked very well. Over time, most of these tractors sometimes rediscovered gathering dust in a farm shed or stalled in the scrub, have been tracked down and restored by keen new owners. This one, still in use on a farm, was driven here especially for the heavy display. The MT855 model, 1980, this, 1980. This, this particular one. This is another the Upton family tracked down and purchased with a plan to restore it. But it'll need a lot of love. Some bush mechanic has made some crude post-factory modifications. Tractor enthusiasts are a passionate type, invariably older blokes, retired farmers, grain growers to be precise, weather beaten by exposure to the elements and decades of diesel fumes and dust. On the outskirts of town, a couple of dozen such folk gather every Wednesday. Officially the Corowa Vintage Machinery Club, it's mostly called the Tractor Club because everyone here seems besotted with them. It's a kind of men's shed with machinery. So that's a lot of it. Brains of what of people who invented them originally started from scratch, whereas now they just improve everything. So, and that's part of it. And uh, I don't know, you've got to be a bit silly too, I think, but <laughs> it's good fun. The technical adjustments. Bill Petschke owns dozens of old tractors but his rare, locally made Upton is perhaps his favourite. Mine's a 180 horsepower one with the four cylinder UD and um, still in its pink colours. <laughs> Carl Upton stepped out of the business a decade ago to let sons Paul and Mark take the reins. I have uh, very fond memories of you know, tractors in parades down the main street on Australia Day and things like that. And, uh, you know, we are, you know, I'm very proud of my family history in, in those tractors, yeah. Upton Engineering still fabricates all manner of things, but irrigation equipment remains the company's mainstay. In the late 80s, the firm built the world's first purpose-built race course irrigator. This is the latest version destined for Caulfield Racecourse in Melbourne. This family has long believed that to engineer its own future, technology is vital. I've always felt that without technology, really, we're a glorified blacksmith shop. So we've always pushed to be, you know, at least up to speed or better than everyone else in the world, you know. So, you know, we have phone apps and the machines can be fully controlled from your phone anywhere in the world and they can give reports on how much water you're using on a crop and things like that. But in times of drought, when water is scarce, business can dry up, quite literally. Like when the millennium drought gripped Eastern Australia forcing the Uptons to venture further afield. And so literally, you know, myself and one of the salesmen hopped the plane and went over there and door knocked the entire coast of <laughs> Western Australia. We did get a lot of work out of that and that ended up, you know, we, we do have a depot over now in Broome. Um, we have one in Darwin. Um, we, you know, we, we have spares in um, you know, Perth and we service cans. You know, we do literally do jobs every day Australia-wide. So, you know, it's, it, it has taken me to every state in Australia and, um, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of these machines all over the country. The firm makes irrigators up to 800 metres in length. The ethos of this third generation business remains the same. Give anything a red hot go. There's just this common myth that people say, well, we can't do that in Australia. And to, to my father's credit, I would have to say, you know, we were never told that you can't do anything. You know, we were probably fed the opposite, so, well, there's a workshop. You can build whatever the hell you want to build. Go and do it. Um, and we did, you know. So we, we never had that 
barrier in front of us and I never had that mentality that we couldn't do anything. Upton's built tractors to meet a market. That factor remains the same. People think that you invent something and then go back to the public and sell it, but it's probably driven the other way. We just respond to what customers ask for. So, you know, if, if someone wants something, yeah, we'll build it. And that's the show for today. Thanks for your company. We hope you've enjoyed it, but we'll leave you with the weekly weather update from the Bureau. Bye for now. Hello from the Bureau, here with your weather wrap for Sunday the 12th of November. In the past week, a thunderstorm outbreak hit the eastern states, bringing welcome rainfall to some cropping regions. However, the rain was storm-driven and patchy, so many areas didn't get enough or didn't get any at all. Today, hot with gusty storms through central and northern New South Wales and southwest Queensland, but generally cooler and more settled elsewhere in the east. Cooler too across much of Western Australia, the interior and the Northern Territory, as tropical moisture is drawn across the continent by a series of low pressure troughs, increasing cloud, humidity, rain and storms. Heavy falls are a risk with gusty winds and large hail. More storms in these parts on Monday and with many wildfires ongoing through Western Australia and the Northern Territory, dry lightning may be a concern away from rain areas. Generally settled through eastern Australia, apart from storms across northeast New South Wales and southern Queensland, where temperatures remain high. On Tuesday, a passing front in the south will drive patchy rain from the Eyre Peninsula to the southeast coast of New South Wales, impacting Victoria and Tasmania with a burst of cooler weather. Rain will converge on the New South Wales coast around midweek, with more modest totals possible. The storm risk on Wednesday will extend from Perth to Sydney and up through the interior to Darwin as well. But rainfall away from the east coast will be patchy. Higher storm totals are more likely on Thursday through northeast New South Wales and southeast Queensland. Northern Australia will continue to warm, but it'll remain cool and mostly settled in the south as a high pressure system digs in. To finish off the week, we'll see clearer skies through much of inland Australia. Patchy wet weather up the east coast and storms continuing across western and central Australia. That's it for this week. We'll see you next Sunday.